Step one, take a hammer to the bathroom scale. Step two, rip up all the diet rule books. And step three, get ready to redefine what health and well being means to you. And guess what? It's not your weight, it's not your shape, and it's not how much space you take up. Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield. I'm the author of the book, Body Kindness, and host for this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I ask that you keep an open mind as we have interesting conversations about what it means in this culture to resist and reject and divest from the norms of health is only for people who are pursuing thinness and weight loss and dieting. We can say no to that. That does not help many people create a better life. But through this show and our conversations, I am confident that you will find your own meaningful path to a happier and healthier life. Even if you want things to change, that's okay. But we have a whole lot of unlearning to do, and I invite you to join me on the unlearning. This episode of Body Kindness is brought to you by the Body Kindness Book and Brave Box Bundle. This is so exciting. Check out thebravebox.com. And for a limited time, you're going to be able to get a signed copy of Body Kindness and a complete Brave Box. And if you enter in the promo code PODCAST, you'll even save 10% off. I love, love, love this gift box. It's founded by a woman who's in recovery from an eating disorder. I love everything inside. It's it's a perfect connection with body kindness to enhance those spiral ups, everything from the beautiful little succulent plant that you can admire and take good care of and just feel more grounded and connected to a really funny magnet. I've seen it on social media, but it's this amazing looking donut. And it says, I donut care about your diet. Some beautiful affirmation cards that just help you feel good and grounded and connected. And one of my favorites, I actually love this so much that I am sharing it with my daughter. It is a therapy dough that's lavender scented. And it's just um, so lovely to kind of do something with your fingers if you're feeling a little bit wound up and it smells nice. Uh, It just helps you feel calm and soothe. So I think this is great if you're in recovery from an eating disorder or know someone, this would be a lovely gift. Or dealing with stress or anxiety or just looking for something that is very body positive and anti-diet and focus on self-kindness and compassion, check it out. This is a limited time offer. Again, that's thebravebox.com and the promo code podcast will get you 10% off. I actually began some of the earliest research on this project in about 2007 or eight. And we have to keep in mind that this was the height of the obesity epidemic rhetoric. Right. Yeah. So the mid 2000s was really the time in which, you know, all of America was sort of on tenterhooks. We, you know, we have to figure out how to get all Americans to lose weight. And so here I am saying, oh, you know what? There might be an alternative history to (laughs) what we're describing. Um, It might not actually just be health concerns that is motivating this Mm -hmm. terror. And so people really did push back against that. It wasn't until maybe about five years ago that I started to see a significant shift. Um, And so I do feel hopeful now that people are starting to think differently, like, wait a minute, the science of obesity is actually rather weak. And I might even call it pseudoscience for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so what is driving this aversion to fat people? And how can we rethink our orientation to health outcomes in a way that does not prioritize weight loss. That was Sabrina Strings. She's an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine, and the author of a new important book called Fearing the Black Body. So in this two-part interview, you'll hear us discuss the racist roots of fat phobia, how religion has played a role in controlling women's bodies, why medicine historically and even today is participating in discrimination through the body mass index and making judgments about a person's health based on their size. Fearing the Black Body is available in print and ebook everywhere. If you're new to body kindness, get started with me free in a virtual support featuring a video on five health rules you should break plus a 
self-reflection guide and more at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. That's bodykindnessbook.com slash start. Enjoy the show. Sabrina, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you for having me on. I'm so, so excited for you to be here. I was actually watching some of uh, some YouTube videos I found of you last night and introducing <laughs> you to my daughters of who mommy was going to be talking to today. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, yeah, that's awesome. Actually, I forgot that those videos were out there. <laughs> <laughs> you I know, nothing ever dies if it's on the internet, right? <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. The eternal archive. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'd love to start the show by letting the listeners know how, how I came to find you and, and, and really care deeply um, about bringing my guests on. And so for you, I was doing as folks do and dawdling on social media, I want to say a couple years ago, actually. And there was an article that was being shared in the Health at Every Size circles that you had won a very important award or a grant from the Hellman Foundation to write the book that I'm holding in my hand called Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. And I was, I, I bookmarked it and I was like, when that book is done, <laughs> I want to talk to her. And I just kind of made sure to follow you for a while. And so I was a fan before I even got the review copy in the mail. And yeah, I just would just love if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about yourself and the kind of work you do to get started. Well, sure. I'm originally from Pasadena, California. And actually, that ends up being relevant to the story of mm. how I came to write this book, uh -huh. because my family is from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia. And my grandparents came to California as part of the second wave of the Great Migration in the 1960s. And my grandmother grew up in a Jim Crow segregated, all Black community, a rural mm -hmm. community in Georgia. Mm -hmm. She moved from there to Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, she's living in an integrated community. And one of the things that struck her pretty much immediately was the fact that almost all of the white women that she was meeting were on diets. Mm -hmm. And she was like, what is this? So as you might imagine, growing up the 1940s through the 1960s in rural Georgia, not a lot of people were worried about losing weight. Mm -hmm. So it was a major triumph just for people to be able to eat regularly. Hmm. So by the time I was in high school in the late 90s, this was something that she would just pull me aside and ask me routinely, like, why are white women on diets? Like, what? Like, what? Like, she, mm -hmm. <laughs> like for decades, she had been puzzled by this. And so, and like, I think in the beginning, she would ask this question. And I'd be like, I don't know. You know, I don't want to think about this right now. I'm, I'm 16 years old. Who cares? Yeah. But later... I started to realize that this is actually a very important question that people had not interrogated before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was in graduate school nearly 10 years after our initial conversations that I began the research for this project. Because you had some element of resilience, right? Like, I can't be bothered by that crap. I'm 16. I want to enjoy my life. Like, I actually think our culture now is much worse off. So I don't know. Do you think it was how you were raised just in personal values to respect yourself or what was your secret? On the one hand, being in a black family and mm -hmm. living in a community that was integrated, I feel like my grandmother in particular did a lot of work to, first of all, provide us with healthy meals. Um, so we always had, you know, collard greens and yams and baked chicken and mm -hmm. macaroni and, and, you know, like the traditional Southern cooking that my mm -hmm. grandmother was a master at preparing. Mm -hmm. And she definitely wanted us to have a pride in our heritage and also our appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, she, my grandmother worked at Macy's <laughs> department store oh. and it was very, very fancy to be able to go in there. And so you need to make sure that you presented yourself accordingly. Right. But at the same time, as I mentioned, growing up in an integrated community, it was it was pretty clear that maintaining a certain weight was important. So it wasn't mm -hmm. as if I was completely unaware of what she was talking about. Mm. I just wasn't as invested in the question as she was. And I wasn't as invested in the practice as I knew some of my white friends were. Mm -hmm. For me, my thought was, okay, I think it's important to maintain a particular type of figure, but it's not of the case Kate Moss type. Mm -hmm. It's more of, you know, something that we would today call slim thick. You know, you want to mm -hmm. make sure your waist is trim, but you have mm -hmm. nice strong legs and this mm -hmm. whole thing. 
All right. So there was still a conformity happening, right? Which from the book, it started like before any of us were ever born. Um, there was still some rule that you were following, but you kind of fit. So you didn't feel the pool, like the allure, the, the allure of dieting wasn't going to be as rewarding to you. It was one of those things where dieting definitely did feel like a moral enterprise. Mm-hmm. Although my my desired outcome was not the same as for a lot of the white girls that I knew. So it felt like, yeah, low fat diets, because you know, this was the 1990s and this was the height of snack whales. It was like, okay, well, you mm-hmm. want to have your low fat diet um, with, you know, a couple of low sugar items. Mm-hmm. Um, but nevertheless, you get to indulge. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, I was definitely aware of and a participant in the 1990s diet culture, but I think I had a different orientation to that um, than some people. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. I really want to also share a little bit about where where I'm at. So I'm an educated white woman, cis, gender, hetero. I have a lot of privilege. I have thin privilege. And, you know, I'm I'm really interested in in having a conversation with you. I've really benefited from learning from Ijioma Luo, who's been on the show before. So Renee Taylor has been on the show before. Desiree Attaway, I use her cards for self-reflection and journaling. I'd like to say all the time, but sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I'm all right. And whenever I'm not all right, I pull a card and I journal and oh. I get better. So hmm. I'm still very much in a phase of of listening and learning. And at the same time, like I want to help myself and my family. You know, I've got two young girls and and also the podcast listeners there's helping professionals who listen there or just anyone trying to walk away from diets at any size. And I really want to help people like create a better life and outside of the personal help contribute to make the world a better place. And I would just love to know before we dive into the details of what you found in your very important, very academic very well referenced book. <laughs> like just is there is there a hope that comes to mind, right? Like when you held your first copy or was there, is there a moment for like a hope that you have now that this book is out there in the world? You know, I really appreciate that question because when I began my research into this topic, I faced a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. So there were um, my peers in graduate school and there were also faculty members that I met at a variety of institutions who thought, A, hasn't this already been done? B, is this academic? And C, is this something we can know or should care about? So it was a really strange mix Mm -hmm. of reservations, right? These three things are, they simply don't go together. Was, can I ask, was there a a race issue in those questions or was it just, I don't know, ignorance Uh, is the word that's coming to my mind. It was mostly men. Okay. So I do want to point that out. Mostly men. Yeah. But not exclusively. Okay. Um, And mostly white people, but again, not exclusively. Okay. All right. There was... Yeah. I mean, so I actually began some of the earliest research on this project in about 2007 or eight. And we have to keep in mind that this was the height of the obesity epidemic rhetoric. Right. Yeah. So the mid 2000s was really the time in which, you know, all of America was sort of on tenterhooks. You know, we have to figure out how to get all Americans to lose weight. And so here I am saying, oh, you know what? There might be an alternative history to (laughs) what we're describing. Um, It might not actually just be health concerns that is motivating this mm-hmm. terror. And yeah. you know, so people really did push back against that. It wasn't until maybe about five years ago that I started to see a significant shift. Uh, and so I do feel hopeful now that people are starting to think differently, like, wait a minute, the science of obesity is actually rather weak. And I might even call it pseudoscience for the most part. Mm-hmm. And so what is driving this aversion to fat people? And how can we rethink our orientation to health outcomes in a way that does not prioritize weight loss. Right. Yes. So I just want to acknowledge, yes, 2007, this thesis and book proposal would have been radical. (laughs) (laughs) Now that you make those connections, absolutely, I could see that. And I'm tracking with you. So Body Kindness came out and I sold the idea in December 2014. It actually wasn't called Body Kindness, though. It was 
fit, going to be a superficial book called Happy Hours. And I was like, no, 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 I actually want to write about something more meaningful. Um, but anyway, uh, it came out around January 2017. And, and even then it was, I don't know, some people, it's still like they're picking it up now. And it's a revelation, you know, being good to your body. <laughs> so so I'm tracking with you along with the Snackwell's comment as well. Um, I think that what I'm what I'm seeing I just love the hope that you're expressing for the book because what I'm seeing is that there is this more of a mainstream awareness about body positivity. In in the medical realm, I'm seeing a little like let's let's not do weight stigma. Let's be nice to people while we perform weight loss surgeries, right? Or let's yeah. let's let's not body shame someone if they come in with an earache. That was in JAMA this year and it's like you can see the steps, right? But it's not really fat liberation. It's not really addressing the systems and the structures. But it's certainly different. I mean, when I was reading some of the history in, in your book, like I used to kind of idealize, oh, at another time, in another place, it was probably better. And, and, and you actually point out in a lot of ways how it was, they weren't even trying to hide there. Like there's a lot of diet and disguise going on now, but it was mm-hmm. just like, you suck and you're eating too much. And so stop eating in like the, a lot of the, like in Cosmopolitan when that first came out as example. But yeah, so so I'm I'm seeing these shifts, but also this sort of, and you talk about health without centering weight loss. And I think that is absolutely key because, you know, there's this message of that we all have personal control over our health, that if uh, we dare have a disease or a problem where we need medical help, we should be shamed that we, we did something wrong. Um, and literally, you know, I mean, and I don't, follow Whole30, but it's just one example of, hey, this is for health. This isn't a diet. It's for health. But it literally says every bite of food either adds to your health or takes away from that. And, hmm. you know, that's kind of extreme. <laughs> every bite. Yeah, yeah that's, that is. Very yeah. Extreme. And and so it comes back to this, you know, I mean, maybe there's a question of are we're operating from the wrong definition of health if it's going to center weight loss. What are your thoughts on that? I agree with that wholeheartedly. When we think about it, what we ultimately hope for, if we are genuinely concerned about the health of Americans, what we hope is that they might have access to safe and healthy foods. Mm -hmm. They might have access to the ability to move their bodies Mm -hmm. and they might have the motivation and interest to actually, you know, eat healthier and um, engage in healthy movement and get enough sleep and get enough water And so rather than trying to berate people for their weight, if we're concerned about healthy practices, we can simply promote healthy practices and make them accessible. One of the things I remember having as a question years ago on a panel that I sat on at Rutgers University, someone asked me, well, if we're not telling fat people to lose weight, what do we tell them? Mm -hmm. And I thought, and I said to them, why would we tell fat people anything other than the same thing that we're telling thin people, which is that it's a good idea to get enough fruits, vegetables, protein, Mm -hmm. and carbohydrates, and to eat enough to move your body and to get enough rest. I mean, effectively, we don't have to have separate messaging if the goal is the same. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And there's so many interesting insights from your book, but but, you know, being like trained in the medical model as a registered dietitian and feeling so proud of like my my flexible balance plates, right? Like here, you know, here's the sort of government guidelines, but be flexible. It might look like a peace sign if you're out to eat or if it's pizza night or grandma's favorite mac and cheese, it might be half and half. And and, and granted, clients really do find that really helpful, right? And then I read in your book about how government food guidance is really rooted in the need to control people at all costs. And I'm like, (laughs) part of the problem, part of the problem, part of the problem. (laughs) And I, that just has been my life, like for the past several years, right? Like accepting what is and trying to learn and grow and accepting what is and trying to learn and grow. Yes. And I'm also evolving as I'm thinking about this. You know, it's not as if I came to this Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the 1990s with the Supreme Awareness. I've learned so much even in the past couple of years. And I think when I first started this work, there were a number of people who were writing in a way that felt liberatory, but they were still talking about portion control. Mm -hmm. And then over time, I started to think, actually, this question of trying to tell people to 
eat healthy food, but not too much, uh, which is the tagline of one of the more famous authors in this field. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Mostly plants, only things grandma would be able to say. <laughs> exactly. So you know exactly where I'm going with that. Uh, yep. And so I remember reading that and thinking, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, this is the kind of thing that I believe in. And then later I thought, as long as we're telling people how much we eat, how much they should eat, rather, mm-hmm. as if we know how much another person should eat, then we're still in the same biopolitical model of population control that is not rooted in health concerns. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I grew up, thankfully, we had WIC when I was growing up. And, mm. you know, when we got when we got the delivery, we, we got more food. I was a little less hungry. You know, we were always stretching a dollar and that, I mean, I am in a totally different economic scenario. Thank goodness. I'll forever be grateful for it, but it's like that, that doesn't leave you. And so when those messages were coming out, it was like, I get the idea and I'm still feeling the elitism in it because unless we have type of structure set up where people have the time to shop, prep, cook, clean, and do all those other things, right? Mm-hmm. Because we have we're making a living wage. Okay, then. But there just there always seems to be, you know, people who get excluded from these messages that sound like some sort of ideal utopia. Oh, and by the way, you'll get the everlasting promise of weight loss. You know. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, so. Some of the work that I did. Uh, prior to publishing this book was around food security, Mm. which is the idea that everyone should have access to uh, nutritionally adequate and safe foods. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, something like 15% of households, so not people, but households, Mm -hmm. right, are food insecure, which means they do not have access to these kinds of foods. And so when we think about the types of interventions that we can make as people interested in public health, this is where we can begin. And it's only one step. I mean, as you talked about, even if we could make uh, safe food accessible, then we still have the problem of individuals who live in marginal housing and don't have access to kitchens. And Mm -hmm. so what precisely do we expect them to prepare for themselves? The relationship between poor health outcomes and poverty is staggering. And Mm -hmm. that's why scholars have long called it a fundamental cause of illness. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to work toward is thinking about how can we best support the entire population to have better access to nutritionally adequate and safe foods. And it's a difficult problem to address, but weight loss should not be central to that. Right. And, and it's, and that's where I, you know, I feel myself evolving to more lately is the sense of when I'm at a conference thinking about the resources that it took to get me there, acknowledging who isn't in the room, um, when I have the opportunity to speak, you know, being able to acknowledge my privileges or write things that come from a place of noticing and, not, and acknowledging privileges. Because I remember when I first started doing a nutrition private practice, I was like, oh, insurance doesn't really work for dietitians, so I'll be out of pocket. And I remember this sort of like, mm. oh my gosh, people aren't going to People are going to need my care, aren't going to get it. And then, you know, in the beginning, it was like when something with a socioeconomic issue would pop up, I was like, oh, well, that's not really my clientele. That's not really my focus. Mm, And I think that that's a message a lot of privileged people in medicine and health and wellness will jump to. And again, back to that, what definition of health are you using? I think we need to figure out who has the power in the system and what are what is the work that's being done? And even though we need to keep doing our work and keep our bread on the table, how can we acknowledge the privileges, verbalize the injustices? Because that those words, it, it has to do something to move the cult- cultural dy- dynamic. What would your thoughts be to that? <sighs> As a person who is also privileged now that I'm a professor and a middle class individual as well, I will say that this is something that is such a difficult challenge Mm -hmm. because on the one hand, also being that I'm a yoga teacher and practitioner, Mm -hmm. I can see that within the yoga community, there's so many resources targeted toward those persons who are financially able to access them. Right. Um, Plenty of yoga classes, meditation, stress reduction, um, sort of dietary advice, if you have enough money to be able to purchase access to these things. Yeah. Um, I was recently having a conversation um, with a professor in public health, and he was saying to me that they're starting to realize that for whatever reason, 
the fact that uh, America is a place where there are so many people who are poor and so many people who do not have the ability to feed themselves regularly is actually affecting the health of the middle classes. And, <laughs> and they wanted to try yeah. to figure out wait, how is this dragging the middle class down? I mean, obviously the person didn't say it that way, but right. I did point to the inherent callousness of the, mm -hmm. of, the, of the focus on how the poor are somehow making the middle class less healthy. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is that that is in fact going on. And for so long, we've sort of, or many people, I should say, have put blinders on and just focused on hitting that segment of the population who has the money to be able to mm -hmm. um, fashion a particular lifestyle of health and wellness for themselves. But now there's a growing awareness in the public health community that if we do not take care of all Americans, then all Americans lose out and not just the poorest. Mm -hmm. So I think there is the beginning of a revelation surrounding that, but there's, it's going to take a lot more work in order to articulate uh, precisely how it is that not allowing universal health care, uh, not allowing clean and safe drinking water, not making allowances for people to be able to walk on the sidewalk because there's no sidewalks. Mm -hmm. How all of these sort of infrastructural problems affect all Americans, even those in the wealthiest communities. Absolutely. And then, you know, pivoting back specifically to the book, how we started about like 2007 and the height of the, you know, air quotes, obesity epidemic rhetoric, all those things that you just mentioned, would they that wasn't what was getting the attention. It was simply you're eating too much and we got to do something about your size. Can I read a little part from, from your book? It's actually in the epilogue, but I think this is a good segue. I feel like starting at the end for the book conversation would be really helpful for listeners. So this is from Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. The image of fat Black women as, quote, savage and, quote, barbarous in art, philosophy, and science and as, quote, diseased in medicine, has been used to both degrade Black women and discipline white women. For decades, white feminist scholars and historians focused largely on the impact of the, quote, thin ideal on middle and upper class white women. They claimed that the thin ideal was oppressive, but also suggested that they did not know how it developed. This book endeavors to address that question, adding a much needed intersectional component to the analysis of the development of fat phobia and the slender aesthetic, revealing race to be the missing element in many of these analyses. So that was my sort of, I guess, wokeness in, oh my gosh, you're right, like in all these feminist movements, like we really don't know. And there's enough there that you had to write an entire book on it. <laughs> yeah. So kind of starting from from kind of what people are uh most familiar with, right? Going to see a doctor, or maybe being you know going for an earache and recommended that there's weight loss. That is something that wasn't always the case, right? There was a transition in which medicine decided to take sort of health and weight on as this thing that they were going to uphold and hold women accountable to, to control. Can you kind of share a little bit more about what you found in your research to that point? Yes, definitely. And thank you for reading that quote, because I think it nicely contextualizes the points that I'm trying to make mm -hmm. uh, in the book, obviously, and then also in this conversation. Mm -hmm. When we look at the work of someone like Barbara Ehrenreich, who had written about medical sexism, what they have revealed is that historically, when the institution of medicine uh, was formalized and professionalized in the United States, one of the key groups that doctors, who were largely men, were interested in trying to reform and turn into idealized healthy citizens were women. Mm -hmm. So women's bodies have long been a focus of control and a locus of medical intervention. And so what happened was that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was this sense that American women were too slender, which when you first hear it is like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but then I'm sure we've also heard of the stereotype of um, sort of Americans being of uh, the sort of the Yankee Abraham Lincoln figure, mm -hmm. in fact. So while well, maybe not everyone has heard of that, but nevertheless, that was a particular stereotype that did exist in the United States for a number of years. 
And so what was taking place was that during that particular period, and the idea was like Americans are for some reason just naturally slender, doctors were suggesting it's actually very important for women to gain weight because we know that women with a particular uh, amount of fat in their bodies, uh, who are just fleshy and curvy enough to sustain pregnancy, are the ones who are going to be the foremothers of the next generations. Uh, so you can find articles about this in JAMA and about the American Journal of Public Health that are really focused on this question of how to get women to gain weight. And it wasn't until around the 1920s or 30s that there started to be a shift. And the idea was that actually we need to get women to be focused on losing weight. Mm-hmm. And 1919, I think the scale was made, like the penny scale went from like this, oh, this is entertaining while we're waiting for the movie to start to, oh, wait, we could sell, you know, we're making a lot of money on these. We can get it into the size that could fit in a bathroom. And now we got to create a need for it. So let's put the woman in her rollers, holding her coffee cup, standing on the scale and saying, hey, weigh yourself every day for health. Yeah. (laughs) And I remember seeing an advertisement, uh, I believe this one was from a little bit of a later period, maybe mm-hmm. the 1940s, sure. of a woman in a bathrobe, just like you've stated, um, standing on a scale, looking down at it, and she's with her daughter. Oh. And her daughter is also looking down at the scale. Oh, and no. so, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, a very troubling <laughs> image, but supposed to be a form of bonding. Mm. You know, Ooh. the mother is inculcating her daughter, introducing her to this particular understanding of what it means to be a woman and a healthy woman. Mm. So this is supposed to be celebrated. It's a good thing, right? This is an example of good mothering. Oh, that is awful. Yeah. Yeah. I I do feel today in my experience as a mom and when people are like, oh my gosh, I have a, I have a question for you. Or I, I had a recent podcast with it, with another podcaster, author and mother, and we titled it, please don't screw up our kids. Kind of like that feeling, right? You know, that, oh my God, you know, somebody talked about cheese and weight gain or whatever it was. That's that feeling that that's how that's. So I do think that there's that for the people who are aware, you know, I'm kind of struggling with body image here. I'm kind of done with the diet roller coaster. A, they don't know what to do with themselves and B, they don't want to screw up their kids. And it just, even hearing from you, I just, now I got to find that image though. I don't really want to look that idea of (laughs) telling people, this is what it takes. This is how you help your kid think about health. I mean, the countless number of people who've been harmed by weighing themselves and kids being put on diets at three and eating disorders. I mean, so, so much harm. Yeah. Can I share one of the most chilling things to me. I like the hairs on my arms just stood up. It's in chapter eight, fat revisited. And, and maybe this is cause this is like my time, but it was that it, but I was really like, this ain't right. You know, that was like my, I came out of my mouth. I think it was 1985 was the year that black women were first included in health reports. And you say that until then, like racial or ethnic Like it was seldomly included in any type of medical analyses. And I was like, what? How do you not even include the people that you're aiming to help? Like that just sounded like racism and an injustice. And yet it's very much true. What can you share with us about that? Yeah. So in the early 20th century through the mid 20th century, there was this idea that we needed to reform women, but the women that they wanted to reform were white women Mm -hmm. because the idea was that we are trying to create the best possible mothers for our nation. And if that's the goal, they're not focused so much on women of color, right? Mm -hmm. So women of color are the people that they're trying to prevent from reproducing. And there's fantastic work on this by a number of authors, but I'll just mention Dorothy Roberts and Killing the Black Body. So all of the ways um, throughout the 20th century that they have tried to sterilize black women to prevent them from reproducing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until the 1980s in which um, a Democratic Congress was actually starting to notice that there were their tremendous health disparities according to race and ethnicity. And so they thought, we need to figure out why it is that minorities, as they would have been called at the time, are experiencing many more negative health outcomes in this country than white Americans. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so it wasn't until after the civil rights movement and the feminist movement that people became became much more invested and interested in trying to figure out why it is that people of color have worse health outcomes. So this is part of the reason why for a number of years in the medical establishment, very little was known about what was happening in low income and marginalized communities. And can you share whether it was in the book or not, what just any sort of like, what did we come to find out about disparities? You know, I know it was only in the last couple of years where I've been able to learn and read that, you know, experienced oppression, experienced racism impacts a person on the cellular level. Yes. And there are just so many factors that contribute to health outcomes, which makes the focus on weight all the more egregious. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I point out in the book, one of the consequences of them now deciding that they're going to shift their focus from largely white populations, populations of color, and try to figure out, well, what is causing poor health outcomes was that they thought, or they found rather, oh, well, their BMIs are elevated, so it must be weight. We'll tell them to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. But in reality, there are so many factors. In addition to the food security issues that I mentioned previously, Mm -hmm. although I did not mention that uh, communities of color, low-income communities, female-headed households are far more likely to experience food insecurity than more middle-class, wealthier, or wider communities. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at all of the factors that are contributing to health disparities, uh, stress is a major component, poverty, lack of access to um, safe drinking water and healthy food. It's it's such a compounding number of things. And I think that a number of public health scholars have did a fantastic job uh, being able to articulate the ways in which maybe one or two of these things might contribute to worse health outcomes. But the difficulty is that it's such a conglomeration of factors that are like embedded, that it's very difficult to be able to say, if we change one thing, then we will change the entire system, unless the one thing that we are changing uh, is fundamentally trying to eradicate poverty. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash bodykindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.